Hey everyone, good morning. Welcome to Daily Drop-In, where we are live every single morning, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern, to start off your day, your day, share some positivity. It is Friday, September 10th. Brad Hughes is, of course, here joining the show every single Friday. I love Brad being able to spend Fridays with you, and I cannot wait to dive into what we have today. We have themes coming. We have some exciting celebrations. We have good news stories. We'll obviously be taking your questions live. And to start us off, we need to do a discussion on coffee. So we are going to be right back here in just a second. Please go fill up your coffee for this morning. And if you need anything from us, if you have questions, if you're thinking through an idea, if you're getting started in a new unit with your students and you want to discuss some pros and cons of your approach, let us know. That's why we're here. We are here to start off your morning to be a brainstorm partner, to share some positivity, and to make sure that you have the best Friday yet. So we'll be right back. Fill up your coffee, and we'll see you in a minute. Good morning. Good morning, Brad Hughes. How are you this Friday? Good morning, Ray. I am great this Friday. How about you, friend? I'm doing well, except I'm not thrilled with my cup of coffee. I don't know yeah. if anyone else kind of knows the feeling of kind of starting your day and the coffee just not sitting right. That's my only bummer for today. But I don't mean to speak negativity into the world. I'm just being honest, buddy. I don't know. Uh, when your coffee doesn't hit right, that that can throw a uh, uh, your day off kilter and it's it's interesting how we develop our our preferred tastes and it, it we were talking last week of course about uh, starting and finishing the day strong and uh, i strong cup of coffee is often how i begin the day too ray so I, I hope you find the right blend i'm not sure whether you're looking for a, a dark roast a light roast a medium roast or something in between i do have to say there is a really strange story with the coffee that i chose to drink this morning and i'm i'm actually blaming my my terrible cup of coffee on my father which I know is strange to say at on a Friday morning at 6 a.m. Central, but um, I have a, a coffee maker that takes a very specific like insert to make the coffee. Yeah. And I you know typically buy in bulk, very easy, no big deal. And I was on vacation this summer with my father and we were renting a house um, with a group of people. And we had been reading what type of coffee maker the, the, the rental house had. Right. And it was the same coffee maker that that I have at home. I was like, oh my gosh, you're going to enjoy this so much. We go to Costco, we pick up these little pods that we need and we get to the house and nope, that's not at all the coffee maker they have. So we have oh. over 200 little pods because we were staying at a house with like 10 people and we tried to buy enough coffee for everyone for the week. So he was his theory was, well, can you take it home? Right. And I was like, sure. So I threw it in my suitcase and today was the day. I'm not thrilled with this new brand, Brad, but I do think that I can blame it on the fact that it was from my vacation two months ago. I, I think that uh, playing the blame game might just put you into a, a position where you can get back to your preferred co preferred coffee uh, as quickly as possible, right? So that's the question. And Brad, you know that I really value your opinion. You are Thanks. an incredibly <laughs> smart educator and great friend. Here's my question. I have 120 little cups of coffee that I'm able to make with this new brand. Do I just power through or do I order a new batch of coffee? I'm the well, brand that I like. Um, I, I'm speaking from a place of privilege where I have the capacity to order all of that new coffee. I, I would just order the coffee. Really? So then who gets the bad batch? Like, is it like when I have guests over that need a cup of coffee? I'm like, oh, hey, take this garbage. Uh, I, I might incorporate it into, uh, into my gardening. I might take the, uh, the, the, the coffee and, and, uh, I don't know, sprinkle it into, uh, some, some compost and topsoil and, and use it to feed the veggies or repurpose it somehow. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> wow. This opened up a whole, yeah, you're right. I guess I could use it for other things as well. I do. I see that, uh, Dr. Dave Schmidt is joining us this morning. He just says to power through and drink the coffee. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I hope that your coffee is 
wonderful and you are getting what you need out of your morning experience. Um, I do love, oh my gosh, Jody, you're so mm -hmm. wonderful idea. She's like, maybe you could find a school or a hospital to donate to in their staff lounge. That is a genius idea. Um, I will say, I assume somebody likes this coffee. I don't mean to say that it's not, it's not any good. It's actually a brand that is exceptionally well known, nudge, nudge. So it really is a coffee that, that thousands and millions of people drink every single day. Um, I will say it's a specific pod you know what i'm talking about like you know how keurig and espresso and they mm -hmm. all those pods so i need to find a school or hospital that like has that specific coffee maker but i love that idea mm -hmm. really really good um dave is making fun of the fact that i have fake plants and so i wouldn't need compost but brad yeah. you seem like somebody who keeps plants alive and functions uh I have very uh, drought tolerant plants uh, outside. I, I cannot keep plants alive inside, uh, except for my school office. I one time had a plant that was uh, 12 going on 13 uh, that I transplanted from my classroom to my uh, to my school office when I became principal. So uh, I, I have good luck keeping plants alive in most cases, but uh, this summer with uh, with ins and outs and rainy seasons and droughts, it's been it's been hard to keep the vegetables thriving. Oh, did you see that? You shared that story and on my face was like, wow. And then all of a sudden the emojis popped up of that like wow face of people reacting, I think over on Facebook being like, oh my gosh, that's an old plant. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> you know, Brad, I will say while plants are a struggle to keep alive, you have a family, they're still alive and breathing, which I assume is also with the support of your wife. But I mean, there's other things you've kept alive. My dogs are alive. I can't keep a plant alive, but I got two poodles, so. That's yeah, hundred percent, and and uh, all credit to my uh, to my wife for uh, wow, uh, just keeping just, just keeping things going and and keeping me focused. Uh, um, my wife Jennifer is a very detailed oriented and and uh, someone who thrives on clear communication, which I don't always provide. I can kind of be pie in the sky and all over the place. And especially as we return to school, uh, things have really ramped up uh, now that we've welcomed kids and families back to school. So. I feel that my mind is in a number of different places. And so uh, I, I, I get gentle, but firm reminders from my family to stay in your lane and keep focused. And when you're with family, you're with family. Let's uh, let's uh, engage together. I do have to say, Brad, I have such a strong desire to meet your family. I, I know we've never met in person. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, there's so many people in the Teach Better family on the Teach Better team, just in so many different elements that I've never met in person. And I mm -hmm. would love the opportunity. I hope that there's an event. And I don't know that like the Teach Better Conference is the right space. I don't have no idea who will be attending that um, as those announcements come out for mm -hmm. the 2022 event. But I will say, I just somehow want to get the entire Teach Better team together with their spouses, with their families, and officially meet everybody. Because you know that it's got to be a good time. <laughs> The better we know each other uh, through our networks and our extended friends and families, I mean, the 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 stronger our networks become. We are reflections of the people that influence our lives, and uh, those connections, you know, between you and me, Ray, and between our Teach Better family. But uh, that extended family throws a whole new lens, and and there's a lot of laughter to be had too, as as family members and friends can shed new light on you know the people that you think you're coming to know through Teach Better. Uh, it's uh, it would be a wonderful opportunity for sure. Oh, it'd be so fun. Yes, I know. I can't wait for everybody to be together and hopefully in a very, I mean, obviously in a very, very safe environment, but someday mm -hmm. friends, we will all be together. We all get to meet and that would be just such a wonderful time when it, you know, Brad, I feel like on this, on this Friday morning, people are slowly getting started. The majority of educators I know are back to school and you and I have discussed this the first few weeks back, even the first five weeks back, depending on how long you've been in your in your classroom again, is exhausting. So as we are slowly getting started, as people are commenting, good, good morning, they're sharing the feed that they're watching, which by the way, we always appreciate. Yesterday I was tagged in a few screenshots of people taking screenshots, tuning into Daily Drop-In and sharing that they were either listening live or that they were listening to the podcast after the fact and they were kind of sharing um, some takeaways, which we always appreciate seeing. I think that we could probably transition here to some good news to wake people up with some good news stories. What do you think? I'm all over it. All right, let's do it. Friends, we are going to head into our good news segment. So take a nice deep breath, take a sip of coffee, and let's get into some good news. All right, guys.
guys, we are going to head into our good news segment where we not only have some news to share with you, some exciting news stories that, Brad, I think you've prepared a good one for today, so I can't wait to get into that. But we also have some celebrations, some acknowledgments, some themes, some goofy, some serious for today. I do want to note that, um, Brad, today is International Swap Ideas Day. What are your thoughts on that? That is a holiday that I didn't realize we all needed to be celebrating. I think it's highly aligned with what we're trying to do here, Ray, and engaging our Teach Better family and others from around our network to swap ideas, you know, the uh, the brainstorm bank. And uh, I think that maybe the reason for the holiday is that we got the daily drop-in going again. Uh, and it, wow, we've got to recognize that. Yeah, no, I love that. Swap Ideas Day. So I guess our challenge for you, how do you celebrate Swap Ideas Day? You got to go to somebody and I guess, build in some collaboration time, right? Yeah, one of my favorite approaches to that is to uh, to pose a question on our staff room whiteboard uh, and mm -hmm. have people either use their whiteboard markers or post-it notes to, to it's actually becomes its own brainstorm bank. Uh, it's like take, you know, take an idea, leave with an idea, that kind of a thing. Absolutely. For those of you who will also be um, acknowledging tomorrow is 9-11 Remembrance. It is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, I, I assume that there's been a lot of discussion in schools, depending especially on where you teach. But um, just as a reminder that that 20th anniversary will be also tomorrow, Saturday, September 11th. Mm -hmm. Brad, for some good news for today, as we get into our, our morning, what is the mindset we should carry for this good news segment? Uh, it, it's a mindset of, I guess, gratitude for innovation. Uh, that's expanding uh, learning opportunities uh, in other parts of the world. So uh, the good news story uh, comes from goodnet.org, and I'll make sure that the link is posted back to our discussion stream. Uh, and it has to do with uh, a solution uh, to building schools in uh, desperately needed areas of the world. Mm -hmm. In Madagascar, which is an island nation in the Indian Ocean off of Africa, the world's first 3D printed school is being built. So the game plan is to kickstart uh, a faster, uh, cheaper, environmentally friendly, community-led growth of much needed schools, beginning with this pilot project where 3D printed walls, uh, a vertical farm and, and solar panels are being installed. And uh, they are drawing on community support to uh, to teach the technology that's, that is required to build it and maintain it. Uh, and then from the pilot, then the project will grow. Incredible. I've seen a number of different videos you know, over the years of, of people starting to look at how to 3D print buildings, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's some homes and huts that have been in a, in a discussion of, of how cheap and, and, and appropriate it is to build in this, in this area. I don't know that I can envision a, a massive school building. I mean, that in and of itself is going to be such a wonderful undertaking. It's much different than say your classroom or public library or even home 3D printer, Ray. It, it, it appears to be a printer that pipes out layers of reinforced concrete. Uh, and so I, I haven't seen this in action, but there are two videos, uh, one of the project and the other of the founder, Maggie Grout, uh, who's founder of Thinking Huts. Uh, and she reflects on the opportunities that her adoptive parents gave her, which spurred her to make a real difference in the lives of people in underserviced and underrepresented communities. And so I'm looking forward to learning more about that and seeing if there are uh, takeaways for us. I mean, talk about swap ideas. You know, if we get our kids and our, our colleagues thinking thinking big uh, about the difference that uh, technology can make uh, and see if there's a connection between or transferable connection between, say, what we experience with maybe 3D printers in our classrooms or homes and say, wow, now we're building schools with 3D printers. Uh, great conversation. Great conversation. You know, our focus um, this week has been this concept of not only being a good classroom teacher, but also striving to be a good staff member. We've spent all week discussing this concept. And yesterday, um, a major takeaway, a major suggestion that Katie Miglin was able to provide is, is was really focused on the concept of questioning, asking questions to to hopefully get to uh, the, the conversation you were looking to have with colleagues and build unity and everything else. Um, with this story, if I'm going to bring this story maybe into my classroom, maybe into a staff lounge to spark conversation, what would be some questions that I could ask that I could pose that could enhance some conversation around this topic? I think there are a couple of ways to structure it, Ray. And what immediately came to mind is uh, 
our our colleague Alex's two key questions. Alex often poses a photo and says and asks, "What do you notice and what do you wonder?" And mm -hmm. so it's possible that you can just uh, prompt uh, your students to watch the video or watch the video of the founder speaking about the opportunity, and and without sort of priming them for what they're about to see, uh, it can be a little bit of a of sort of a surprise and aha moment for them. And then you can pose those questions that, that Alex advocates. What do you notice and what do you wonder? And then the, the, the opportunity is to see where those questions take you. Um, and, you know, questioning in, in terms of working with students and growing learning is so, so powerful because it reinforces that the answers lie with them. Uh, you as a teacher or facilitator are, are organizing the questioning, but then you can apply the questions that are coming forward uh, and, and you, can, you can grow the learning from the inside out. I, I, that's an incredible suggestion, Brad. I can't believe that that just came out of, out of your mind as a suggestion. I love that that is a focus. There's a lot of people in the comments saying that he, they really love that Alex does this. Mm -hmm. Where are these posts? How can we go find that? That's a wonderful thing that he's chosen to do. Uh, in our teach better, uh, Facebook group. And so if you go to, I think it's teachbetter.com slash group. Is it's that right? Right teachbettergroup.com group. and it will redirect Perfect. you to the private Facebook group. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will we'll check with Alex. That's where I've seen him post those and and perhaps on Twitter too. What do you notice and what do you wonder? Um, and they can be photos of the everyday, like anything that's spark, any kind of prompt that it's going to spark those discussions. And the, the other thing I really admire too, Ray, is that it challenges all of us to look deeper and to think deeper past the surface, you know, whether it's a, uh, an object, an event, uh, a place, uh, a person. Mm -hmm. There, there's so much beyond the surface that we may miss or may not take the time to contemplate. Oh, what a great beginning to a conversation. I, I love that this can be something that you can apply to actually any any other topic that you want to spark discussion, whether it be with students or with your colleagues. I think that that is a, a great, great concept. You know, with the theme this week being, you know, not only educators' responsibility to be strong instructional leaders, but also this this responsibility to to give back to the entire school as a as a functioning ecosystem. I'd love to have us transition into that conversation a little earlier than typically um, on this Friday morning, because Brad, I know that this was a discussion that we were very eager to have with everyone to kind of wrap up this concept for the week and send us into next week's theme, which is even getting deeper into another topic that we feel like is really dear to our hearts. So Brad, we're gonna quickly transition to our brainstorm bank so we can dive into that idea. If you're watching with us live, we'll be right back. If you're listening on the Teach Better Talk podcast, then feel free to take this moment during the transition, take a screenshot that you are listening and share that on social media. Make sure to tag Brad and I, Brad and I. we would love to see that you are participating, even if it's after the fact. All right, you guys know how our brainstorm bank works. We are here. It's an intentional moment where we are pausing our conversation to say, hey, do you need anything? You know, the Teach Better uh, team developed the daily drop-in during the beginning, beginning steps of as COVID entered the U.S. specifically, and we wanted to make sure that we were accessible. And while it has been quite some time since that time, we are excited to bring the daily drop-in back to your mornings so that we can continue to be accessible as a brainstorm partner. As you continue throughout your day, whether it be at 7 a.m. in the morning or later in the afternoon at 7 p.m. as you are winding it down for your day, we really want to be here to see if there's anything that we can help you with. So you can always submit questions if we're not live over at teachbetter.com slash daily drop-in. Or if you're live with us currently, you can throw your questions in the comments and we will do our best to brainstorm alongside you. Brad, the theme this week continues to be something that I have struggled discussing because it just seems like an, an, another thing on teachers to do list. And that became really hard for us to discuss throughout the week because, gosh, we just don't need another thing on our to do list. Can you tell me some perspectives you've had jumping into this week as a viewer and then obviously being here to wrap up the concept for uh, for our week today? Absolutely. It, what 
continue to come to me through your discussions uh, with your guests on Daily Drop this week, Ray, in terms of uh, navigating uh, maybe some tension or maybe some uh, some concerns about uh, balance or, or or blending your roles in the school between a strong instructional leadership as a classroom teacher, or as an educator, and, and a strong team member. Uh, I'd like to think that both can and should be one and the same. That is, as we build connections uh, naturally through relationships in our buildings with the educator across the hall or with your admin team or with your special education leads, uh, they are supporting you in fulfilling your core purpose, which is mm -hmm. to do all you can to engage, teach, reflect on, and then repeat with the, the students in front of you. When we meet a large group of students returning to school at the first time, there are so, so many unknowns. And, and part of the unknowns that can feel laid on as we transition back to school could be who's going to run this club, who's going to run this team, who's going to run this choir. Um, and so we are falling back. There's a risk of falling back on what has always been done. And we there, you have no argument for me, Ray, that those extracurricular opportunities are key to kids' success and many kids' engagement with the school. But I always want to fall back as school leader on reassuring staff members that our core purpose is to educate and to make sure that you are supported in maintaining your mental and physical health and well-being so that you can engage first and foremost with the kids in front of you with strong teaching with engaging learning and build the relationships and then as opportunities present themselves it's more likely that staff members like us have the energy and capacity to to do a little bit more in, in our yeah go ahead ray no, I was going to say, so I think it's important to highlight the, one of the components that you've shared thus far is that as we are in this deep reflection on our own practices of, of thinking through how we can give back to our classrooms and any responsibility or opportunity we have to also be a good staff member and support the, the whole building, you know, as, as in its entirety, an element that you've brought in is you truly feel like the classroom must be the first moment of reflection. And then if we have capacity, it's then with that capacity, what can we do to support the building? Is that is that an accurate representation of what you've shared? It is because I, mm -hmm. I think that uh, part of the conversation about being a good staff member uh, may automatically lead towards what what are we expecting? What, not what are we requesting, but then even what are we expecting others to do to, to keep uh, the extras, the, the 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 extracurriculars, the additional things running. And I, I think that people's capacity is going to be uh, limited to do that if they are really struggling with uh, instructional decisions, how to how to serve the kids right in front of them. Um, and so it's it's essential. I mean, as a school leader, it's essential to me, and I, I want to invite uh, school leaders that are listening to to reflect on how you, uh, support the kids, uh, sorry, how you support the adults that are supporting the kids. Uh, and as we get to know our staffs, uh, as school leaders or, or as teachers or, or educational colleagues, focusing on our core purpose first allows our confidence to grow. We come to work knowing that we are working towards meeting the needs of the kids and families in front of us. And it also allows us to learn about one another's strengths. As we learn about instructional strengths that are going to meet the needs in front of you by talking with colleagues, by, you know, collaborating. That to me uh, is part of being a good staff member, a strong staff member, is understanding that uh, while things may feel very, very busy and while your head may be full of, I have to do this first, then next, finally, there, there is a network of people around you that A, are probably going through the very same thing, mm -hmm. especially at the beginning of any school year. And B, uh, the answer is in the room. The answer is in your school somewhere. At the beginning of the episode, we talked about swapping ideas. Uh, the The answer is somewhere. We just have to be intentional about letting others know that the need is there and that we could use the expertise. So I'd love to do a little bit more of a deep dive into that, that reflection on capacity. I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of educators that, that, that are listening to Daily Drop-In that are thinking through well, gosh, my capacity almost feel like it, it ebbs and flows constantly, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the morning, of, at the beginning of the day, I might say, oh my gosh, I am I have no capacity. I have so much going on today. And then they get to their lunch or their planned period and they're like, 
ah, the, the day slowed down. That's really helpful. And then they get to the end of their day and they're like, oh my gosh, now I'm rushing on to the next thing. And, and it also can ebb and flow by week. I know a lot of educators that within the first two weeks of school, holy cow, they have no capacity left. They're they are so you know swamped. But then maybe we get to the end of September and things have kind of gotten into a jive. We feel a little bit better. And then it revs back up for parent-teacher conferences in October. So with that evaluation of capacity, how does that affect what we're discussing now, that that reflective moment that I'm going through, that as I'm thinking through, oh, I have, maybe I have a little of capacity to give, where do I take that? How, what do I do with it? The, 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 the recognition that you have the capacity to give is, is key. Uh, and it reminds me, if we just back up a step, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of Lindsay Titus's work on uh, blend versus balance. Um, and Suzanne Daly, I just listened to her podcast um, and she was also talking about uh, something similar. It, it's about satisfaction. And mm -hmm. so both Suzanne and Lindsay agree that there, there is no such thing as balance because when we talk about balance, we're always striving for a 50-50 measure of what I'm giving to work and what I'm giving to outside of work. If we're talking work-life work balance. So mm -hmm. Lindsay says, let's shift to work-life blend. We, we are 100% ourselves in every moment we devote to whatever we're doing. Uh, life is life. And so there's work, there's family, there's activities, there's that kind of thing. And, and Suzanne takes it one step further and says, um, it's, are you, are you satisfied with what you're doing? So in this moment or in this part of the day, is this bringing me satisfaction or frustration? If it's bringing you satisfaction and you recognize that you have additional cap capacity to give, that's when you just name your intention to, to someone who is in a position to help you to apply that capacity, whether it's energy, time, expertise, uh, specialized knowledge or training, uh, just just make the offer, uh, make the offer to colleagues or make the offer on a, a staff bulletin board or, or email. And I've got the because people are always looking uh, for helping hands, but also they're also looking for brain power. They're looking for people mm -hmm. who have tackled challenges that may be in front of them that, that they're wrestling with. Uh, and that's part of being uh, a, a connected staff member as well, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking through really this concept of, okay, I have capacity, now I'm just kind of vocalizing it, right? I'm putting it out into the world to see with the limited capacity I have, who can I help, who can I support? That in and of itself is such a huge element of being a part of the whole school ecosystem is you are supporting one another. And so you could choose to go to the teacher down the hall and say, hey, I have a few minutes. Is there anything that that I can do to, to help you? I love that there's a number of different elements that that you suggested that I could think through, whether it be me lending like my hands, me lending my my mind. My, you know, There's a number of different things there. I could also choose to go to administration and say, hey, I have, a, I have, a, I have some capacity to take on a little bit more work. Is there anything that that you need that I can support you with? And you know, something that came up in a discussion that I was having with a few educators yesterday, you can go to the PBIS coach for those schools that are using, you know, any sort of um, system that is behavior focused, a school wide initiative and, and go to those leaders and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help? Because now you're really looking at the, the, the different passions and supports of the school building and seeing if you can support in those areas. And it doesn't need to be a long term commitment. It could just be whatever capacity you have to offer. I think that's a very interesting addition to this week's conversation. I think that service can be so helpful mm -hmm. for our physical and mental and emotional well-being. I notice myself that when I uh, when I start to get down or frustrated or when I, I start to dwell or when I've got like intrusive thoughts, looking outwards for any small opportunity to serve and help someone else uh, interrupts that negative thinking. It interrupts those intrusive thoughts. And it, 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 it's a it's a brain body shift that I can actually feel. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that when we discover that we have that additional capacity, it's also OK to turn inwards. Like we, we don't necessarily have to immediately look outwards, especially if there's something inwards that we can nurture or if there's something again, if we, if we want to pour our energy back into our core purpose uh, of educating the kids in front of us, it may be time to turn inwards and say, what do I need to do to invest a little bit of time or care or compassion for myself so that I can maintain that capacity on an ongoing basis. Because if you, if you, mm -hmm. if you run out of capacity, then that'll lead to fatigue. And then if you mm -hmm. continue to draw on capacity that you don't seem to have, 
the fatigue can easily learn to lead to overwhelm and burnout. And so it's always okay to devote that capacity back to yourself as, as really a, it's a gift to yourself so that you can better serve others. Can I ask a silly question, Brad? I, I, I don't get to ask questions very often on capacity, but the topic of what people can or can't take on handle at this given moment in time, mm -hmm. X, Y, Z is constantly coming up in my world. So mm -hmm. can I ask like a foolish question? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. First is do, does everyone have a different level of capacity or at least is it your belief that, that, that is the case. And then the second is, is there a way to change or develop or grow a greater capacity? Or is that not a, a concept that, that you can do? I understand I'm asking a question that may not have an answer, but in your opinion. In my opinion, one's capacity uh, may be expanded or limited according to the stressors that are in our lives at any given moment. So mm -hmm. stress is not necessarily toxic or bad. It's, it's anything that causes us to expend energy so that we can keep ourselves, our brain body, in equilibrium, in balance, so that we can avoid fatigue, so we can avoid stress overload, so we can avoid tipping over. So um, learning in learning is stress. And so when we invite kids into our classrooms, we we are stressing them. Uh, I don't I do not mean that we are we are stressing them harmfully. We are we are challenging them to engage with information, opportunities, learning that is burning energy. And so when the energy is burned, it has to be restored somehow. It can be stored with rest. It can be restored with personal connections. It can be restored with good food. It can be restored with sleep. It can, I like to call it, you know, you know, restore by turning to the people and activities that you love most. Yeah. Uh, we, we often, like, I think, I really do think people's capacities are, are, are just limited by those stresses and, and those, yeah, those stresses that they are carrying. Uh, and sometimes we are carrying a very heavy load. Sometimes it's a load that's seen and understood. Sometimes it's a load that's unseen and even not quite well understood by ourselves. Uh, we may be feeling down, off, out of sorts, tired out, and then we add additional stress trying to reason our own way out of it. Um, and you know, you know, sitting with your emotions and just naming that I'm feeling tired, frustrated, upset, fatigued, sad, that, that just, just being um, emotionally aware of, of what stresses are impacting you. And so as, I mean, as, as colleagues or as, as school leaders, it's, it's trying to create conditions where you are reducing stress for others so the capacity can, can flourish. The, the, the stress masks capacity. And so when we, when we are able to relieve stresses or when we're able to anticipate stresses and, and reduce them upstream, reduce them before they lead to overload, then, then the, capacity, the capacity may then be revealed. You know, it's interesting, Karen in the comments is noting that she's an introvert. So her capacity is lower for social things. And I think that that leans into a lot of what you've shared, where for her, social interaction, social events um, are more stressful than it might be for for myself. And so she's saying that that it takes more out of her to be a part of those situations. You know, I I always describe my capacity, and maybe it's only to Jeff Gargas because when I'm stressed, I go to Jeff and I tell him about it, and I don't think he appreciates that too much. But <laughs> I think um, I describe my capacity. I, I I always find myself going like this, right? Like I have my hand mm -hmm. by my head, you know, showing you that, like I'm almost full, right? Yep. Like when you get to the top, I'm at a hundred percent capacity. I have nothing left to give, and um, when I'm able, like you said, to do things that that relieve stress, right? You know, um, in the comments, there was some discussion of like needing downtime, mm -hmm. um, to family time, maybe taking the dogs for a walk, alleviate stress. That to me then lowers, lowers the stress level and my capacity is then left. So um, I think it's interesting to discuss this idea of kind of taking an intentional mm -hmm. moment this morning for all of you, especially that are tuning in live. But even if you're watching this after the fact, take a moment right now to do a gut check, right? So where is your capacity at? If it starts at your toes and goes all the way up to your head and 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 that's 100% of stress, meaning that you have no capacity left uh, to give others, um, where, where are you at on that scale? And if you're able to share in the comments right now or able to share uh, later as you're listening, make sure you tag Brad and I and obviously the Teach Better team on whatever platform you're sharing. 
Um, I'd love to, to kind of hear a reflection, a gut check using that percentage scale of where you feel like your stress level is really landing. Is it is it appropriate to say like, you know, it's kind of a like stress is on one side capacity if there's, I don't know, like when I'm saying like I'm full all the way up, that means like my whole body is full of stress. And then when it goes down, what's left is that capacity. That makes sense, right? It does. And it's really strange, right? Because I think of an empty gas tank rather than a full one. But conversely, I also think of a full coffee cup, which is awesome, going down to empty. So it, it's it, you know, the the there will be constant shifts in how we uh, interpret uh, what we feel we must do, and the, the other stressor is what we are called or expected or directed to do by others. Well, and that's interesting. So you're right. Depending on the analogy, you're either measuring the stress or you're measuring your capacity. I think for me, I'm constantly evaluating my stress. And, and what would be left of that if I'm not at 100% is then the capacity that we're discussing. So I'm eager to hear kind of where people's thoughts are. I can only imagine, Brad, for the educators, you know, today's Friday, September 10th, for the educators that maybe started school recently after Labor Day, that was a very popular day for a number of schools to, to start back. Yeah, their capacity is extremely limited. That stress level is very, very, very high, if not at full capacity at that 100%. So that makes sense to me. Um, whereas other educators might say, no, I, you know, I've been in school for the last few weeks, I feel like we're in a groove, I have a little bit more to give to others. Um, very interesting element, Brad, that you've brought into today's conversation. I appreciate it. You're, Ray, thanks. And I think it's just, it's essential for all of us to name that we're, we're, we're teaching, we're continuing, we're teaching in a pandemic. We're, we're teaching in a pandemic. And so regardless of what we feel we're asked to do or need to do or called to do or directed to do in our working lives, there is there talk about layers of stress that there are there are physical layers, uh, masks, goggles, gowns, gloves. There are emotional layers, uh, fear, worry, illness, death. Uh, and uh, many of our schools are welcoming kids back into their buildings who actually haven't been in a school building for 18 months. And so for 18 months, uh, they have not had, or maybe not had, the the regular interaction, the regular flow of, of those community relationships in a school building. And when that happens, we've got all kinds of people, both adults and kids, who are coming back together um, in, in, you have to rebuild that community. And there's all kinds of dysregulation that comes along with that as people just relearn the business of getting along with each other and, and coexisting peacefully and successfully because the level of stress that the pandemic has brought means that it is absolutely understandable that we have, we 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 arrive where we, we arrive at work already in fight or flight mode already in um uh, already in overwhelm because of of worry and so that that's also that that's that stress is also going to diminish the capacity that you have uh, and it's easy to get to a point where you feel that there, you feel that there are there are too many demands and simply not enough time. Uh, and all, anyway, all of those layers work together. And so if 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 we just continue to be self aware, and I would say it's it can be so challenging. But name what you need mm -hmm. to someone who can just be a listener, like Jeff Gargas, or someone who is actually in a position to to help you to reduce those stresses. Yeah, I want to clarify when I'm going to Jeff to tell him I am full of stress and I don't yeah. have any capacity left. I'm actually telling him he has to fix my problems. I don't right. know that he's quite a listener, but I'm going to him and saying something of this needs to be adjusted and it is your job to do it. <laughs> Principals and, and school leaders can be key in this equation because mm -hmm. when 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 folks are str like you can you can feel the difference in the building like you can just sort of feel uh, the climate is tense uh, mm -hmm. you can actually see that the people are walking around eyes lowered they're work walk going at a clip their the breaths being held and so it's essential whenever possible for school leaders and others that are in positions of staff support to go out to your staff and and, and make quick but sincere check-ins because if you are waiting to hear how you can help people may never come yeah, that's a good, oh, if you're waiting to hear, people may never come. It's true. Brad, I know it's a personal question, but where do you feel like your capacity is at this morning? Uh, I think I have about 20% capacity. I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm running at about 80. So I, my, 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 I'm not sure I'm thinking like an RPM. I'm at 80. I, I think I have 20 left to give. I know that arriving uh, at school this morning and, and 
supporting staff and working through some very natural challenges as we return to school. We we're we yeah we're learning about what kids need. Uh, some kids have high needs that we need personnel to support and meet, um, and uh, having the personnel on hand has been very challenging at our school site right now, as it as it may be in many school sites where you know the the stress and the overwhelm is is really taking a toll on people's uh, health, well being, and 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 ability to attend school. The so um, even this morning, even before daily drop in, um, I'm I'm trying to set the framework so that folks at school have a plan and feel supported when they arrive in terms of addressing what those needs and challenges are. The, the, the other, the other thing that I really want to make sure I have capacity for is, is reframing what we're, we're experiencing with our staff members and our, and, yeah, with, with my colleagues, not, not rose colored glasses reframing, like, Oh, we know it'll always get better. It's always like, we, we can say that, but we, we also have to say, I, I think this maybe came through, um, uh, our Teach Better network. It's it's one thing to say you've got this. It's another thing to say you've got this, and and we're we're here to support you with that. So, um, reminding people who are stressed and reminding people who are, who are really in the trenches, as Daniel Goodyear says, that um, we we will find solutions. We may not have the solutions right now, but we have great people around us who are going to try to dig in to find them. I love it. You know, this has been a really interesting layer to this week's conversation as we dive into being a, a strong instructional leader in the classroom and then also choosing to be an active participant in the entire school ecosystem. There's been a lot of suggestions shared this week. And I think this final wrap up of saying yes, all those suggestions are incredible opportunities you can take forth and, and go explore. However, choosing the right one does come down to understanding where your capacity level is at and constantly doing a gut check of where that is, being honest about it, not being shameful or, or disappointed, but truly just being aware of where that capacity lies with you in your current state, uh, knowing that it will ebb and flow will allow you to make those decisions that not only best serve you as, a, as an individual, but also then allow your your communities to thrive. We're going to transition here to doing a quick recap of the week, kind of going through what has been going on this week and, and all the suggestions that have been shared that kind of led us into this discussion on capacity, which was an incredible moment that we are able to kind of use as our wrap up our bow on top of our discussion this week. So we'll be right back. You know, Brad, that's my favorite. <laughs> I was just grooving along to that too. I was like, mm, yeah, yeah. I don't know Weekly. why all of the little intros, I really do love the songs. At some point we mm -hmm. should just goof off and play all of them together so we can mm -hmm. actually compare them. Sometimes when you're hearing them over the course of a week, you don't necessarily like hear how different they all are. But um, right. I just really, I like that one. That one always just hits the spot. It's like a happy song, you know? I was just going to say it hits different. I'm not sure if it's the positive anticipation of, of recapping the week with you or whether it sort of represents kind of like a, da da we did it. Daily drop in yes. for another week is wrapping up. But it, yeah, it just hits different. I have to say, Brad, I um, we have a number of different courses coming out in our academy, which I don't know if that's a secret. I've just been talking about it. I'm sure somebody yeah. is like Ray, like slapping my hand, like stop telling people it's not out yet. Um, but we do. We have a lot of courses um, that are in the works right now that will be released over uh, the next few days, uh, the next few months, uh, all those pieces. And there's an audio element for the introduction to those courses. If you've ever taken a course in the Teach Better Academy, you know there's a little introduction before the video begins for that self-paced um, educator training. And I had to choose the audio yesterday for a course. And I really struggled with it, Brad. Really, I feel like choosing music to represent something that you are getting into, um, like a learning experience, is, is really important and stressful. <laughs> It really is because uh, at that moment, Ray, you, you and others who are developing these courses embody uh, the content and you embody the goals for the course. And so it may take a number of a number of listens to think, 
yeah, that and it, it's visceral. Like that just hits right. That that hits right for what we want people to experience, to anticipate. You know, opening music is really going to set the tone for exciting and helping people positively anticipate what's coming next. And it's uh, it. We talked earlier about the power of music to energize and and to frame and to provide anchors. And yeah, no wonder it's a hard thing because you care so much about the content and you care so much about the people that are going to dive into it. Well, I will say the course I was working on yesterday specifically is a free course. So for those of you, whether you're an Academy member or not, be able to get this new course for free. And I just don't know. I'm like 90% confident on the decision we made on the music. But for those of you who were who are thinking now like, oh, free course, I'm going to go take that um, as it comes out. Let me know what your thoughts are on the music. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, for this week, Brad, it was a it was a weird week. We, we had Labor Day off. We weren't live on Monday um, for the holiday. So our week kicked off on Tuesday with Jeff Gargas, who, who is always wonderful to start off our week. Um, he had a few tech issues. It was a little bit of a, a wacky day on that Tuesday coming back, which I'm sure was very representative of how we all felt coming back after a long weekend. Um, but as we got into our discussion of, you know, teacher choosing to not only be a good instructional leader, but also trying to give back to their full building, their full staff, the week kind of transitioned as we discussed with Andrea and Katie. Andrea's focus was really on the concept of all the different opportunities that exist in the school system. Not only the opportunities that we can create for ourselves by, by talking to our colleagues, but truly the clubs, the organizations that exist that we can choose to lead or sit in on or be a part of. And so her bringing that concept was really uh, kind of the first layer of this conversation. And to me, Brad, that's kind of what I feel most educators think of when when you say, hey, go get involved in your school, they think, oh, I need to go be a part of a club, right? Do you agree with that? I do. And, and that's why I'm really, I was really excited to hear you continue to refer to the school community as an ecosystem, because there are many, many layers of influence that educators can have. Um, when I think ecosystem, I think of words like flourish, thrive, grow, oxygen, breathe, nourish, and uh, clubs, teams, sports, and activities are are one aspect of that ecosystem. In many, many cases, uh, those opportunities serve to uh, fulfill us as well as fulfill the kids that we serve. But uh, there are many more ways to contribute uh, to that ecosystem uh, if you are just just constantly scanning the environment, the ecosystem for opportunities to contribute. Uh, there are other ways to do that. Yeah, no, I and I I really encourage you if any of you have not tuned into um, Wednesday's daily drop in with Andrea. There were so many layers to that conversation. I just think Andrea as a as a person, like Andrea is just such a wonderful educator. I know she's a part of the Teach Better team, but she is so passionate about her backgrounds in teaching ELA. And she just has this like beautiful personality. I just think mm -hmm. any discussion with Andrea kind of leaves you smiling. I was actually in multiple meetings with her yesterday where she was working on a few different projects. So um, if you did tune into Wednesday, I felt like Andrea really constructed a strong base for our discussion, um, kind of bringing up all of the typical things we think of and and what different opportunities lie in those um, in those areas. Katie then joined us on Thursday and she added in another layer of how to support the ecosystem, which which blended beautifully into our conversation today because her focus really was on, yes, if you're not going to go lead a club though, what are the other avenues? And her biggest element was being a supportive educator of social norms that exist in the school building, how you go about reinforcing not only the, the rules, quote unquote, that you know exist in the school, but bringing in some unity with, with uh, your colleagues down the hall or, or in similar workspaces to know that you're all sending the same message. And she had a great example of a time that she went to her colleagues to pose a question, not to tell them what they should be doing, but but to seek understanding. And, and she was being curious about a concept that then her and her colleagues were able to come together and say, let's work on this together. And that really does bring an element of unity that ex absolutely supports that ecosystem we discussed. I love that conversation uh, with Katie. And I, I love how curiosity can be 
such a powerful stance in uh, improving ourselves and improving our schools. Curiosity positions as us positions us as people who are looking to work shoulder to shoulder and and to come together rather than you know getting into shouldville as Lindsay Titus would say you know we're should we be doing this should we not we shouldn't like let, let's get curious about it and, and wonder you know I wonder you know if you sorry back to Alex again I notice I'm noticing that this is happening in our school and I'm wondering what am I wondering mm -hmm. and that that's that curiosity stance and it, it's very very powerful I'm really glad that came to the fore with your conversation with Katie yesterday Absolutely. And then it really does all come together with today's conversation. I feel like we started with what everybody predicted we were going to discuss in the week and transitioned into some very, very important elements that we need to consider before we step into those official roles is really just better understanding, regardless of how you're going to support that ecosystem, the concept of capacity and your stress level being the first gut check that you need to do to make the right decision when you're getting involved. Brad, I feel like you added a layer, kind of like the first step we all need to consider to actually decide where we head in, where we take this conversation moving forward as we reflect on the discussions of daily drop-in and actually put it into action in our own lives. So I really appreciate that element of today's conversation. It's been wonderful. And I, I was reminded of a of a conversation, I think it might have been a Twitter chat where um, Lindsay Titus and Livia Chan and I were involved in Jillian Du Bois, and uh, an idea came to me that I I put forward, and the idea was that um, each of us is the irreplaceable element in any interaction. So just by showing up with presence and willingness to be real, uh, be authentic, be ourselves, uh, whether our capacity is zero or a hundred. We are the irreplaceable gift in any interaction uh, within our schools, with, with others, with classrooms. And so, you know, as we, as we learn to sort of name our gifts and, and give ourselves permission just to say, yeah, uh, showing up is where I'm going to start today. And then I'm going to see where the day takes me. Um, each of us is, is irreplaceable in the, in the ecosystem of our schools. Uh, and each of us has such a valuable contribution to make. Mm, so important. Brad, do you have a, a little bit of a challenge of food for thought for our network this week? We do have a, a big week coming up next week with a new theme and new guests. Just to preview that a little bit, our focus next week is equity and inclusion, which I know is an initiative that many schools have, have made the appropriate decision to truly dedicate some serious time to the work that needs to be done in this area we have educators joining us all week long. Obviously, we'll start with Jeff Gargas, who always kicks off the start of our week on that Monday. We have uh, Jed Deerberry, if you are not following him. Holy cow, what an incredible educator. I'm I'm having a little bit of a moment. I'm a little geeking out that he will be joining us on Tuesday. I will do my best to stay composed during that conversation, but I think he's probably as cool as cool can be. On Thursday, um, we have Steven Weber joining us. He has been a blogger for the Teach Better team forever. And when I say that he's been a blogger, I mean that he publishes like multiple blogs a month with us. I think the last time I was looking, he had like six blogs published in one month that he's constantly, constantly sharing. So I'm so eager to hear his thoughts on this topic. On Thursday, we uh, will move forward with some discussion with Caitlin O'Connor, who is a constant voice especially on Twitter, advocating for um, this, these discussions to not only happen right now, but to continue to happen in our world. And then obviously on Friday, we'll wrap up with our conversations, Brad, always kind of concluding the week together. So with this important topic coming, is there any food for thought that you can provide our viewers today, thinking through how we take the information from the week and think through what, how, what we want to do with it, the action we, we, we might want to take or consider so we can be ready for a new topic next week with Daily Drop-In. The, Ray, the thing that comes top of mind to me has to do with, uh, with overt and hidden stresses. And so we talked together about the uh, ability of, of stress to, to mask or diminish capacity. And as we shift the conversation to equity and inclusion, um, I'm reminded of the burden of the oppressed. That is, in in, in our spaces, uh, kids and families that have been underserviced, undersupported, that have been oppressed, are are often the ones that are are called to bear the burden 
of bringing that oppression to to our attention uh, and to relive the oppression or the harm in order to help it to move forward or to help seek relief from it. Um, and uh, we talk about capacity. I mean, we, uh, that, that's a, that may be a hidden stress that, that, uh, that our colleagues and friends and, and students who, uh, who are underserviced and supported, they, they, they bear that in their backpack all the time. And so uh, as educators, we have to be incredibly compassionate and we have to be incredibly brave uh, in challenging uh, our own perspectives and, and challenging uh, you know, school leaders, it's challenging not only who am I serving, but who am I not yet serving well? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that the the uh, concept of, of of stress in our lives and, and the, the way stress can interrupt capacity, I think that's highly aligned with uh, with moving forward on more mm -hmm. equitable, more inclusive, uh, anti-racist and anti-discriminative schools. Oh, such an important tidbit. I appreciate that, Brad. I hope that each and every one of you take on this challenge to continue this reflection, choose to actually truly take that gut check multiple times throughout your day, share your thoughts with us. We'd love to be here to support you and help you in finding that balance and also allowing us to continue this conversation moving forward as we dive into next week's theme. Brad, thank you for joining. Obviously, every single Friday Daily Drop, and I love concluding my week gain a talk shop with you. So thank you so much for being here. For everyone else, thank you for sharing that you are doing such incredible things with students. We want to hear your voice. We want to be a part of your celebrations, your brainstorming moments, the moments that you want to continue to foster for students. We are here to help. So thank you for all that you do. We hope you enjoy your last sip of coffee, regardless of what type of coffee you're drinking this morning. Brad, I wish you nothing but a wonderful day. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Ray. Great to be here. So good. For everyone else, we will see you on Monday bright and early at 7 a.m. Eastern for Daily Drop-In.